Hello, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks is a digital interview series that we started during this work from home period with the world's leading and most foremost investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're trying to do with these SALT Talks is replicate the experience that we provide at our Global SALT Conference series, which is to empower big, important ideas that are shaping the future, as well as provide our audience a window into the mind of subject matter experts. And we're very excited today to welcome a legend in the field of chemistry to SALT Talks, and that is Dr. Lawrence Rocks. And conducting today's interview is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of SkyBridge, as well as the chairman of SALT. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Anthony, for the interview. John, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rox, I'm, uh, I'm beaming in today from beautiful Venice Beach, California. So I'm trying to dress like a millennial. You know, I'm com competing with John Darcy for likes. So hope you'll forgive me for my attire. You look great, by the way. Let's, let's get into your background, sir. Why did you decide to become a, a chemist? Where did you grow up and what motivated you to take this uh, arc to your career? I grew up in New York City and... Uh... At the age of 12, our class uh, in elementary school had a science project. So I elected to try to make a telescope from available lenses, a long focal plane length and a very small uh, microscope piece. And I put together a telescope that actually could see a moon of Jupiter. So I was very excited to see uh, Jupiter as a disk and a little tiny spot, which was a moon. And uh, couldn't wait to tell the class about it, which I don't know how it went over, but uh, I enjoyed it very much. And that sort of started me on a path of interest in astronomy and science and, and chemistry. They're all sort of, uh, they come together, especially my interest uh, in latter years with health and the environment. The environment is a tremendous area encompassing so many different things that you can go a million different directions in it chemical, astronomy, climate, and uh, so forth. So um, I'm focused on health matters dealing with health and the environment. Well, you, you published in 1973 uh, a paper called The Energy Crisis, and it influenced the creation of the Department of Energy under the Carter administration. What was the book about, sir? Why did you feel it was so important at that time to have a unified national energy policy? Well, at that time, there was a, um, a looming shortage of uh, gasoline and oil, um, exacerbated by a, an embargo on this country. And uh, I thought that uh, energy would be a very critical issue. Uh, it was very difficult to get the book published. The publisher sent the manuscript to various universities and uh, Professors in a variety of very big name schools said anything will never be a story. Don't bother with it. But uh, uh, I persisted uh, with my partner, Richard Runyon. He's now deceased. And uh, we did manage to get a publisher crown. And uh, sure enough, energy, energy became quite a story and is, is still a story. It's just lingering. It pops up here and there with wind power, solar, and nuclear. Uh, and so forth. But that was my basic motivation that this is a story that's good for a lifetime or more. Do you think that oil, sir, is still a national security issue for us, our reliance on it? Yes, I do. I think that uh, oil, of course, the technology of uh, drilling has in, improved so that the old uh, uh, method of measuring reserves uh, oil recovered per foot of drilling is slightly old fashioned, but uh, it's still an important measure. But we, we've got to wean ourselves uh, a little bit off oil, which brings up a very tricky question. Many people are saying we've got to end the fossil fuel era, which I don't think is at all practical or meaningful. But we've got to simply reduce and use oil more wisely and on natural gas. Uh, so I have uh, thought of strategies over the last uh, almost 50 years now since the book. I uh, can't believe it's that long, but uh, <clears throat> the strategies that seem to 
be most appealing are so encompassed in so-called green revolution, but how to harness the wind and sunshine, that's the problem. And I think they're being harnessed all wrong now. What we need to harness the wind is a North American wind, offshore wind alliance with Canada and Mexico. Why? Because the stretch offshore, Canada through America to through Mexico, the wind is always strong somewhere. So you wouldn't need much backup, east coast, west coast. It's a regional issue. If you pick one area, the wind is erratic. The wind is erratic all over the world, but when you add them all up, a stretch like that of six, 7,000 miles, the wind is reliable because it's always blowing strongly somewhere. And another reason is that wind on land, the real estate is against you. I mean, T. Boone Pickens had a company called uh, Mesa Energy building windmills up the central part of the U.S. and the company went bankrupt. The, the, the wind power for a thousand megawatts of wind, which is typical power plant, that's installed capacity. You know, it's not that when the wind doesn't blow. But for a thousand megawatts installed capacity, you might need 20 or 30 square miles and 500 windmills. The real estate is against you. But offshore, the real estate is not against you. But to compensate for that big area, you need, I think, robotics. So one of my themes I believe in passionately is that the Green Revolution will not happen without robotic assistance to monitor the security and minor repair uh, thousands of windmills stretching from Alaska all the way to uh, southern Mexico. Uh, the potential wind power would give us all the electric energy we need. But that, that's a power grid problem between nations. And we need cooperation, I think. So let, let, let's talk about that for a second. So you're, you're saying we're going to always, at least for the immediate future, we're going to always have some reliance on oil. Right. You'd like to bring you'd like to bring it down. Uh, so let me ask you about the Green New Deal, which has been proposed by uh, some some people, some people on the left. Uh, what's your opinion of the Green New Deal? I'm not familiar with the details, but if we're to save oil and natural gas, we've got to also harness sunshine. But I believe it's being harnessed the wrong way. Solar electricity has not worked in 40 years. And I don't think it's gonna work in the next 40 years, except on an extremely local basis, highly subsidized. And my reasons are that uh, the solar panels convert sunlight into electricity in a PN junction, which wears out with time because of atomic migration. So the solar cell is not eternal it may lose 50% of its power in 20 or 30 years. It's gotta be replaced. You need a large area. So how to harness sunshine? Solar architecture. If homes and buildings were designed to absorb sunlight in the winter and shield them from sunlight in the summer, the energy saved would be very important, but oil, gas, and electric power. We've gotta harness sunshine first as solar architecture, second as electricity if possible. What, what is your view of what's going on now with uh, the climate? Uh, are you a believer in climate change, sir, based on the science or what's your view? Oh yes, uh, I, I think climate uh, change is way beyond theoretical. It's here, uh, global warming. And with and, and it's it's being born it's man made man and woman made it's being created by the admission of all the CO two. Well, there's there's a very complicated story. Nature has its own cycle. Uh, drilling into Arctic ice and measuring the isotopes of oxygen sixteen to eighteen shows that in the last four hundred thousand years we've had about five ice ages. The way the earth has behaved apparently from oxygen isotope measurements, 50,000 or 60,000 years of very cold weather compared to what we know, and then 
10 or 20,000 years of a warm spell, which we're in now. So we've had five such cycles, long before people were here, long before industrial revolution. For some unknown reasons, there is that pattern revealed by isotopic chemistry in the polar caps. Now, where are we now? According to that rhythm, we're about a thousand years overdue for an ice age. However, right now, there's a problem of global warming because we're in a, a, a relatively warm period, maybe coming out of it. Where does mankind come in? Well, we're contributing through carbon dioxide and methane but there is a very big disconnect here, which is why I, I propose weather station moon. And here is the disconnect. In the last 50 years, carbon dioxide has risen in the atmosphere at least 50%. But temperature on the Kelvin scale has not. It's gone up maybe 1%. We are experiencing more carbon dioxide and more methane in the atmosphere and more uh, unstable weather, stronger winds, stronger hurricanes, very unstable weather patterns, and yet the global temperature doesn't seem to have risen. It may, maybe it's hard to measure. So my concept is weather station moon, an unmanned telescopic station on the moon to take a look at the earth in the infrared to get its true overall temperature. And you could also pinpoint areas telescopically. So you could get pinpoint temperature and global temperature. And secondly, to look at the cloud cover, not just visibly, to see if it's increasing or not, but in the ultraviolet, to see if there's more silicates up there. The silicates would reflect uh, sunlight and cause the Earth to get cloudier and colder, the so-called albedo effect. So the, a cloudier Earth would be a colder Earth. How do we measure it? Well, orbiting satellites gets some idea, but we need a total global picture of the Earth. And the only way to get it, I think, is from the moon. So are, are, are we doomed at our current projection? Some people are saying that we're in an irretrievable position, or do you think it is retrievable? Well, I think it's very erratic. It's, uh, it's almost like the stock market up and down. Uh, there was a little miniature ice age in Northern Europe, 1590 to 1640, well-documented in literature and, and paintings, known as the Little Ice Age. Now, so that could be a, a forerunner of the fact that we're on a slope toward another ice age. But if the, that might be a hundred or a thousand years from now, the, the, the uh, isotopic uh, record uh, indicates we're overdue for an ice age for whatever the reasons are. Uh, but for the moment, it looks like global warming. It looks like polar caps are melting, seeds may be rising and people will be moving inland and northward in the northern hemisphere, inland and southward in the southern hemisphere, but who knows at what rate. Now along comes the COVID virus, and that's accelerating everything. So there's, there's a gradual trend, hard to detect, inward and northward in the northern hemisphere, but COVID has now accelerated everything. Uh, we can see uh, satellite cities, more telecommunications. Uh, I, I think the trend is not going to end. It's just going to be erratic and it may extend way past our lifetime, children, grandchildren and so forth. But I think the, uh, the future is this inland and upward northward movement, more satellite cities, more telecommunications as we're doing right now and more short trip airline travel. Uh, and I also think that if we do uh, the w North American wind alliance properly and have sufficient electricity, more electric vehicles. I think the, uh, the electric vehicle future is very, very bright with the movement going on now, if we take care of the power grid, which we're not doing. The electric power grid in this country is not being properly monitored. It's got to be expanded. 
for remote sources, and it's got to be monitored. Uh, for example, in California, had we had in place uh, drones to take a careful look at the power grid, we'd see that in certain places there was tree overgrowth. Now that's not uh, any any one administration's fault. It's just that's just a fact of nature. So with uh, sub, uh, robotic surveillance of drones, we would see that and maybe be able to correct some of it. But the high temperatures in California are quite a mystery. It's, uh, but you would say that the wildfires and the hurricanes are coming from the climate change, from the global warming, or you think that's just a natural phenomenon? How would you, how would you assess that? There is global warming and it's triggering, triggering off something that's very unstable. For example, a few weeks ago, we had a dust storm from the Sahara Desert traveling all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, with the weather station moon, you could monitor that very clearly. It would really look like uh, something uh, on uh, nightly TV. Uh, and it's happened before. Uh, the, and right now, the fire is in California. The dust has reached Europe. You can detect it can almost see it. Uh, during the, the uh, Dust Bowl of the 1930s in this country, dust was picked up in New York City from the far west. Now, had we had a weather station moon way back then, you could really follow that. So what I'm saying is that the trend, the immediate trend is global warming. There may be in the future, I don't know, 100 years, 1,000 years from now, a freezing trend because we've had these cycles for the last 400,000 years. But we've got to monitor the situation now in terms of the total earth and parts of the earth. See, from the moon, you can get from infrared light the total temperature of the earth. If you try to piecemeal it together, it's very hard and it leads to a lot of controversy. And we can get the total cloud cover the percent, the reflectivity of the Earth. So we need the Earth's total temperature as well as pinpoint area temperature, total cloud cover as well as pinpoint cloud cover, wind speed, and it relates to weather forecasting and the famous problem of North Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere air exchange, which now has come to light with the COVID virus the experts are saying, well, in, in South America, when, when they're having their uh, winter, the, the virus seems to spread. And when we get all winter, we're probably in for a uh, spread of the virus up here. So predicting weather patterns, seasonal weather patterns would help. I don't know how much, but I think it would help in predicting virus uh, outbreak. Uh, Doc. Doc, John Darcy, we're getting a lot of questions piling up uh, from the audience. So I'm going to let John Darcy uh, cut in here and ask you a few questions from uh, people that are thinking about these big issues. Sure. So I'm going to start on a more lighthearted issue and then we'll get back into the deeper issues. But, uh, you know, you're a renowned chemist and you've applied your knowledge in chemistry across a variety of different subject matters you know, starting with energy in the 70s, as we talked about, including public health, but you've also done work in sports. And I think it's really interesting the work you've done with St. Louis Cardinal shortstop Paul DeJong um, regarding uh, different experiments about optimizing, you know, bat speed and, and uh, launch angles and thing in baseball. Talk about the research you've done in the baseball world. You were honored by tops uh, and given your own baseball card, which was a first for a chemist, but talk a little about the work you've done and and what you've learned about how to optimize you know, performance in baseball. Well, what Paul and I did was we uh, heated a baseball and looked at its bounce and cooled it and looked at its bounce and sort of uh, studied the elasticity of the uh, surface of a baseball with respect to temperature. Uh, elastic materials tend to get brittle at low temperature. They lose their bounce. And at very high temperature, they tend to get soft. They lose their bounce. So if a typical elastomeres is an optimal temp temperature for their elasticity, like an automobile tire, it's got its own range. A baseball has its own range, uh, seems to be most flexible around 70 degrees. 
uh, different materials will have their own ideal flexibility temperature range. And that was done in the hope of uh, encouraging school children to do their own experiments. And that's what the program with TOPS was all about. Helping school children realize that uh, you can do experiments. You don't need sophisticated scientific equipment. Uh, economic status is not a, that big a hindrance. Uh, children can play around and, and do something of a scientific nature. So we have another question, again, switching gears back to uh, the solar energy piece. And we have a couple of questions that I'm going to combine into one. And that's about what are the best storage systems that we need to meet, to meet peak energy demand as we transition to more erratic sources of energy? And do we have the infrastructure in place to build a better smart grid on top of existing infrastructure? Or do we need to completely overhaul our energy grid uh, to, to prepare ourselves for the future? Well, I, th I think energy storage is a tremendous problem and there isn't any simple answer to it. So what I'm thinking is that what we need is to somehow harness the eternal sources of power, sunshine and wind, and then have a backup. But battery backup has never proved economic on a vast scale of a nation's power grid. So for my concept of a North American offshore wind alliance, I envision a small nuclear backup small nuclear power plants. The old nuclear power plants, 1,000 megawatts, they have too many problems, heat loss. It's been going on for years, but the smaller power plants, as you'd find on a submarine or an aircraft carrier, don't have the heat loss problems because they're smaller. So we need small nuclear power as a backup. And uh, for decades, I've been saying, go small, go small. Utilities have been saying not economical, not economical. The Gates Foundation has uh, funded research in what's called a traveling wave nuclear reactor. The fuel rods are moved about so that the plant doesn't have to be uh, refueled more than once every 20 years, they think, for theoretically speaking. It's being built right now in China. Why is something funded by the Gates Foundation being built in China? Because of the red tape in this country. Maybe red tape is a bad expression. There's too much, people are leery of nuclear power, and rightly so, because the power plants are too big. They're melting down, they're not cooling off. I mean, if you have a, if you boil a potato in water and take it out of the water, it stays hot a long time, but a piece of potato cools right off. So my answer to nuclear power is go small and the nuclear waste has to be buried in nickel steel containers offshore in the ocean by robotic submarine. People are aghast at that. Burying nuclear waste on land is never going to work because the radioactivity dies off. It takes at least a thousand years. You can't have multi-generations of people adhering to safety protocols for a thousand years. That's not going to happen. There's no societal mechanism for that. And it, it's almost as if in the days of Julius Caesar, there were rules about burying nuclear waste and we're adhering to them today. The waste material has to be buried in a place where it's inaccessible and perfectly harmless. And that's nickel steel containers they don't rust in salt water. Buried deep in the ocean floor by robotic submarines, there will be no problem. Now, we can opt not to have nuclear backup. Then the question is, what is the backup since the wind will always be somewhat erratic? And the only answer I can think of is extend the wind system. In other words, if there was some way to tap the entire earth it's always windy somewhere, but then we'd have to be sharing electricity around the world. So I foresee regionalism. Uh, where we are, the region would be Canada, the United States, Mexico. Go offshore, you don't have a real estate problem. Hook up 
all the uh, windmills in one giant power grid, three nations are involved, and work out the rules of sharing power. That I see, they see is the only way to avoid the fact that people are leery of nuclear power, and secondly, battery systems don't work. In terms of bearing nuclear waste at sea, would that have any adverse effect on the marine ecosystem? None, none whatsoever. Uh, the uh, nickel steel propellers of the Titanic uh, in, in all these years haven't rusted. The steel cylinders won't rust at the ocean floor. They're inaccessible. There's, even if anyone were to try to dig them up, there's nothing you could do with them. The radioactivity will decay significantly in a thousand years, completely in 2000. If you put it on land, there'll always be a problem with security of that land site, always. And uh, uh, for example, the Yucca Mountain Project failed. Why? Because there could be an earthquake and uh, canisters could fracture and material could make its way through the fractured earth. But in the deep ocean basin on the ooze of the ocean floor, that's impossible. So I'm going to call you after the SALT talk about starting a business to create these uh, robot submarines that we can bury the nuclear waste with, Dr. Rocks. So just look out on your phone. I'm going to give you a call. Um, another question, we have people following up about wind energy. So a couple of the common criticisms of wind energy are the effect they have on birds and, and uh, animals in those ecosystems, as well as disposing of the uh, wind turbine blades. So the, the blades are massive in size, obviously, after they uh, complete their useful life, they're buried in uh, landfills, but they're so large that they obviously create a ton of waste. Are those concerns that you think uh, you know, make wind energy less attractive, or do you think those are just hurdles that we have to overcome? I think those, those concerns are real, but I think they're small compared to the real estate problem. You see, the wind, uh, a typical power plant, whether it be nuclear, gas, oil, coal, is about 1,000 megawatts. 1,000 megawatts on land, you need about 20 to 30 square miles and maybe 500 windmills. That's a lot of land area. Think of the real estate. Just think of how impossible that would be in New York City. That would be ridiculous. One power plant replaced by 30 square miles of windmills. Uh, it's a real estate problem, as happened with uh, T. Boone Pickens and his company, uh, Mesa Energy. It didn't work. It, it, the, it's not an engineering problem. It's real estate. It's economic. The best place for wind is offshore. Uh, now we need a big area, so we'll, we'll have to go to a big area. So I think the biggest stumbling block the harnessing wind is it's almost political. We've got to get North America, Canada, the United States and Mexico must cooperate. Now, years ago when I was uh, doing work on, on the uh, book, The Energy Crisis, I had an idea that the gas being flared off in the Gulf of Mexico, flare gas being wasted, could be harnessed and piped. Uh, that the United States and Mexico should join up and uh, tap that natural gas and pipe it. And uh, uh, it was an idea. Uh, it never saw the light of day. The, the economics, the politics involved. What happened was uh, the uh, countries of the Middle East, uh, Exxon Mobil, lowered the price of oil. That killed that project. You see, it's all, it's compared, there's a lot of competitiveness going on. Uh, one industry will lower prices to put another one out of business. So I think the impediment to wind, I know that the windmills have, they have a hypnotic effect. You know, it's an interesting phenomenon. 60 cycles a second seems to induce epilepsy in a very small percentage of people. So that's a problem. Birds being, bird migration, that's another problem. I don't, I don't want to trivialize them. I just think that they'll, they're way behind the biggest problem, which is economic, the land area. It's just too large to put on land. Got to get it offshore. 
Now, now that way you've harnessed wind, but harnessing sunshine, all the projects being funded are solar electricity. That's the hardest way to go. The easiest, the best is solar architecture because the solar architecture will last forever. I mean, as, as long as the home of the building, whereas solar panels will definitely wear out. Atomic migration happens at the PN junction. It's a natural phenomenon like water evaporating. So whatever solar cell you invent, atomic migration will blur it and make it useless in whatever, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, the, uh, it will go down in efficiency. Solar electricity has, is economically disadvantaged. It sounds beautiful, I love it, but it's economically disadvantaged. Solar architecture is the way to go. And we have uh, another question about nuclear energy and you know, nuclear fusion is sort of the holy grail of nuclear energy. And there's been you know, people that have tried over the years to create a, a nuclear fusion reaction for the sake of producing energy. Do you think we'll ever uh, get to the point of creating a fusion reaction uh, to create energy? Because if we do, obviously it would solve a lot of problems if you can do it safely. But what are your thoughts on that? It, it would, theoretically, it would solve a lot of problems. Uh, the, the Russians pioneered a uh, design called Tokamak. It's, uh, it's a tunnel, a magnetic tunnel to confine plasma. And he, in this country, we've uh, pioneered uh, laser fusion, pellets of uh, deuterium, little glass pellets that are hit by laser light from all directions. The problem with thermonuclear energy is that once you get ignition, it's so hot, it is just high temperature. It seems to destroy the very container it's in. So I don't know about uh, thermonuclear fusion. I think it's uh, very theoretical at the moment. It's way off in the distance. I don't see any thermonuclear electric power plants in, in my lifetime, or I don't know how it's ever going to be done, if at all. I think the way to go is standard nuclear, the way the Navy did it, small nuclear power plants. Now the utilities will say, well, that's not very economical. And my answer is, you're right. It's less economical than one big plant. But what, if one big plant melts down, how economical is that? Like Three Mile Island or Right. Fukushima in Japan or uh, the Russian power plant, that's not economical at all. That's what stopped nuclear power. The danger of a large plant overheating. If you have a small plant, it won't overheat. What about geothermal energy? We have a question from our audience. They mentioned Yellowstone as somewhere that's somewhat central that could be potentially used as a source of clean energy. Do you think geothermal energy has a, a larger future in the United States and around the world? I'm not sure about it. The power plants that uh, I've read about uh, seem to admit uh, sulfur deposits. Wherever there is geothermal energy, there seems to be uh, gases off gases from the hot lava down below. And they're usually associated with the air pollution, a lot of uh, off gases. And there also could be a problem with uh, earthquake production. And I just think it's too limited. Well, Dr. Rocks, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. I want to kick it back to Anthony if he has a final word for you, but we, we appreciate you coming on and you're a well, legend. I want, to, I, appreciate I, I, I want to talk about you. Before we leave, I want to talk about your legendary baseball status, Doc. Uh, the, uh, the shortstop on the St. Louis Cardinals, Paul DeJong, uh, attributes uh, a lot of your insights to his prowess on the field. Tell us a little bit about that. You said to me something a few months ago about ligaments, which I've never forgotten. I'd like you to share that with <laughs> our, uh, our audience. And tell us how you ended up getting your own baseball card. Well, the, the story uh, is muscle versus ligament. <clears throat> Muscles produce energy, ligaments produce power. Power is energy per unit time, it's the snap. It's like a bow and arrow. The, you just stretch the uh, wood and release it, release the string and it uh, snaps back. 
So the muscles are providing energy to the tendons. The tendons stretch, then they snap back. And as we age, tendons get more crystalline, less amorphous. They get more brittle. They could get stronger. Are you, are you listening to that, Darcy? Your time's going to come, okay? Are you listening to that? It's already coming too quickly. Dr. Dr. Rox and I are already dealing with that, Darcy. Pay attention. I already need a knee okay, replacement. So go, so go back to the crystalline. Go ahead. What happens, Doc? The, the, the best um, 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 gymnasts are teenagers. And then in your 20s, you lose that, and certainly in your 30s. But it, it's a, a well-known phenomenon with uh, tendons and uh, ligaments that as we age, they become more crystalline and less amorphous. Almost like the automobile tire industry has this problem. Uh, the rubber has got to be amorphous enough to be flexible and crystalline enough to be strong. So the weightlifter is developing strong tendons, more crystalline nature in the uh, proteins, less amorphous, less flexibility. So they're strong, but they're less flexible. So uh, the discussions I had with Paul is that there's got to be a balance. And I have no idea what it is for any one individual. It, it's an aging process, but uh, there is a balance between being very strong and not being flexible enough to hit a baseball or being very flexible and not being very strong. So you, it's got to be a balance. So I think, uh, the way the athletes tell it to me, too much weightlifting is not good. You well, get, you get Tom Brady lifting weights, but you don't get better at hitting a ball. Yeah, I mean that's Tom Brady. You're you're preaching Tom Brady's philosophy there. You know, as he's aged and he's the oldest quarterback in the NFL and one of the oldest that has ever played at a high level in the NFL. And he talks a lot about uh, flexibility and pliability versus trying to get stronger. And it's it's helped him extend his career. He, he uses a lot of band work, right? He doesn't really use weights, right? He's just using bands mostly, right? So that's one of, that's one of the things that Paul and I have discussed. And the other thing I, I've discussed is uh, low-level air pollution. Uh, you know, they, this COVID virus, they're, they're cleaning facilities, right? You can overclean. I mean, you can have so much cleaner around that it affects the lungs. And the, some of the chemicals interact with each other which is a subject that goes, I think, unnoticed. For example, cleaning fluids that have chlorine and cleaning fluids that have acetic acid, if you mix them, you can get trace amounts of chloroacetic acid, which is, can cause scarring of lung tissue. So one of the phenomena I'd like to study, I'd like to get into it more deeply, is low-level air pollution how it can take the edge off an athlete. A little bit of carbon monoxide or a little bit of cleaning fluid or a little bit of ozone. Let us say that it's reducing oxygen transfer in the lungs by 2%, uh, hypothetically speaking. So you've got 2% less energy, hypothetically speaking. So you hit a baseball 400 feet, what's 2% of 400 feet, eight feet. That could be the difference between a home run or a ball court on the warning track. See, for a non-athlete like me, that you wouldn't even see the difference. But for an athlete where the edge counts, I think one or 2% loss of power, loss of breathing, loss of oxygen transfer makes a big difference. So, so Doc, what would you recommend? Instead of the cleaners, get these air filtration systems? Not only, yes, filtration and also air, air it out. Right, well, open the window. The vent, right, ventilation. When, once right. The cleaning fluids do their job in minutes, but the, the excess can linger for hours. Right, so open the, the window. Oh, with Anthony, I make sure to follow that advice. I would never let him in the car, Doc, given his habits, his hygiene habits. That's fake news. He's never been in the car with me, okay? God only knows what he does in his own house. There's a reason why the uh, bookshelves are green behind him, Doc, just so you know, okay? But uh, tell us, all right, before we let you go, tell us about the uh, Topps baseball card. We all want to hear about this. Well, I'm very, uh, I feel very honored that Topps made a baseball card uh, for me and for Paul, uh, for our, our work 
uh, with uh, projects that children uh, that might interest children in science. I think that should it should work to interest children to uh, do things of a scientific nature. It's quite an honor. I hope I can live up to it. Oh, no, you look great in the card. I, 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 I love it. Well, we, we appreciate having you on. And uh, I'm going to turn it back to John, where he's going to talk about some upcoming SALT conferences. And hopefully we can get you back, sir, after the election and talk about the direction of the environment, the economy, and uh, all things related to chemistry. But thank you so much for coming on today, Doc. Anthony, I can't thank you enough. This, for me, this is a great opportunity. I appreciate it so much. Thank well, I want, your, I want your message out there. I just think it's super important. Let's turn it back to John. I think we got the best of them, particularly when I said that the, the bookcase was green for a reason, Doc. I think we really nailed them. Go ahead, Dorsey. Anthony's jokes always you know, hit hard. But yeah. thanks, everybody, yeah. for joining us yeah. today on the Salt Talks with Dr. Rocks.